us pray. Father, I thank you, Lord God, for Resurrection Sunday, Father. It's a day we come back to remember, Lord God, what happened on this day so long ago. Thank you, Father, for your goodness, for your mercy. It's in Jesus' name, amen. I want you to know that I feel totally inadequate this morning. But there's someone inside of me that is wholly adequate. And I'll depend on him, and I'll listen to him. Yesterday, we went out to John's Island for a birthday party for Kayla. She's three years old today. I don't know if she knew it was her birthday or not, but we all knew whose birthday it was. They had a, they had a, a pony out there, and they had a, a pink mat on the pony and a pink saddle. And I didn't think anything of it. And I went to ask my grandson, why aren't you riding the pony? Because at his age, I would have been on that pony. He said, I can't. Well, why not? I, I just can't. He didn't tell me why, but I found out why. <laughs> because the saddle was pink. <laughs> so he couldn't do that. <laughs> I was talking to a man yesterday, uh, a Christian man. I didn't really realize he was a Christian until I started talking to him. Of course, his T-shirt should have given it away. This man, he lost, he lost a child when the child was very young, and that in itself turned him toward the Lord. A lot of times that will turn you the other way around. But I was talking to him, and, and in talking to him, he said that he had met my, my daughter and my son-in-law and how impressed he was with them. Mostly with my daughter, well, really with both of them. <laughs> so, I, you know, he was impressed with his daughter, and I was impressed with his daughter because she was a free spirit. And we were just talking about things like that. And I just want to say this morning that I'm impressed with you people. I got here this morning about 9 o'clock, and I opened the back door, and the heat hit me. The, the heater was turned on. You could feel the comfort. Linda was already here. She had opened the church. And then we come down here for prayer, and you got Annie down here and Mary and Linda and Missy and myself. And I don't have to run nothing. You know, I don't have to do anything. They know what to do. That's it. They know what to do because the Spirit of God is in them. I, I let off in prayer, but then they take up in prayer, and they lead off. And they're praying this, and they're praying that, and I'm thinking, I don't have to worry about that. I don't have to worry about thi this. They're covering this, and she's covering that, and then she's covering this. It all works together for good. I was impressed with the Sunday school. I was impressed with the message. I was impressed with the men in the Sunday school doing their part. I walked past the women's Sunday school. Somebody in there was giving the word and was excited about it. That was impressive to me. This uh, Sitting here listening to the music, the music was impressive. It was inspiring. It was anointed. I was sitting over here, and this little girl and this little boy sitting in front of me, and this little girl, she's singing, alive, alive, and she looks at her brother. I guess it's her brother, alive. <laughs> you know, I, I, I enjoyed that. That little girl right there. <laughs> and then he's over here. What's he doing, man? I was impressed, and I appreciate your love of the Lord and your worship. That impresses the Lord. I, I'm impressed with Willie. Willie come up here, open the service up. Charles come up here. He did his thing, which I can do it if I'm in the shower by myself. <laughs> I have trouble with that. He's a natural. Mike is a natural back there. They asked me one day, do you want to stand back here and greet? I says, are you kidding? <laughs> I can't greet anybody. I can look at you. I can't go much further than that. But I'm impressed with the body of Christ. I'm impressed. I want to give a testimony, a very short testimony. I want to add it to the lesson here. When I went out Friday morning to get the newspaper, it was, uh, it was very calm, very clear, very quiet, no wind. There was no clouds in the sky. And the full moon was hanging there. 
the sun had not quite come up yet. And you can see the moon, you can see all the features, you can see the sea of tranquility. There it is. And you can see this over here and this over there. You can see all the different parts of the moon. And it's like it just, it just looks at you. There's that ball just hanging there. There was no supports. There was no wires holding it. There was no foundation underneath it. How did that big ball just sit there like that? And I'm just, it's quiet. The birds aren't even singing. I'm looking at the moon. Look at that. Look at what God has done. He did it without my help. He just did it on his own. Jesus holds all things together, and he held the moon uh, right there. It's, it's a perfect distance from the earth. And, you know, I looked at the moon, and everything's still. It's not moving. Oh, but it's moving quite rapidly. It's moving so fast, and it's moving at the exact speed that it has to move to stay where it's at. I was impressed with God. What a lovely name, the name of Jesus. Today, we call it Easter. You know, the word Easter comes from whatever, some religion. People don't like the word of, of Easter. I know a very well-known preacher that doesn't even like the word. Uh, it's the goddess of adultery, I think is what he called it. But, you know, so is Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. They're all named after things that we're not proud of. But, you know, this is the Lord's Day, whatever you call it. It's resurrection morning. This is the morning, and this is what we're celebrating. We're celebrating resurrection morning. The name of this message is Raised to Newness of Life. In 2 Timothy 2.9, I'm going to be mostly in the King James this morning. Well, actually all in the King James. It says, remember, remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. This is Paul speaking. So this is a day of remembrance. We come to remember. It's not like you guys have forgotten during the year that this was resurrection morning, but this is a time when on purpose we remember. So just remember that. I had the television on the other day, and I was watching the newscast. And, you know, they have the little, little frame Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and they'll have a little sun or, or a cloud or whatever. Well, over Sunday, they had a little bouncing pink rabbit. Well, what is that? That's Easter. So if that's all you have to look forward to on Sunday is a little bouncy rabbit, then you don't know the value of today. And that's what the world says. The, the news report says, now this is the day that Christians believe Christ was raised from the dead. Well, yes, we do, as a matter of fact. Uh, that's, that's ours. But, yeah, you're, you're accurate about that. And then a little something about the Pope and about Jerusalem. That's usually the whole Easter report on the newscast. We live in troublesome times. I said this last time I was up here. We live in troublesome times, but God is pouring out his love and he's pouring out his grace that where sin abounds, and you see sin abounding in the world today, it looks to me like it's getting worse and worse and worse. But the worse it gets, the more able we become. Because as sin abounds, and you see all this dirt coming on the earth and coming in the world, we are more able to do what God has for us to do. That's why we were born in this age. God has a job for us to do in this age. And he's going to make us able to do it. When I went in the military, I went with my little bag and one change of clothes on my back. When I got there, they took all that away from me, and they gave me what they wanted me to have. They gave me the clothes, socks, haircut. They gave me everything they wanted me to have. They fed me. They gave me a place to sleep. When you're in God's army, God will take care of you. He will give you everything you need. He'll give you the weapons that you need. Everything. God will take care of you. When I was in the Navy, I had a dentist. I had a doctor. I had whatever I needed. I had a shower. I had a bar of soap. I had everything. They provided everything for me. God provides everything for us. And as it gets worse and worse in the world, he will provide for us all the way. We won't be lacking. God is not waiting for anyone to become acceptable to himself. You know, well, if I have a little more time, just a little more time, I remember 
when I was young, I had left home, and I, I heard some news back home. There's going to be a, a high school reunion. And I, this was a joke. It wasn't original with me, but somebody said, I got three months to make something out of myself <laughs> so I can go back and impress people. It doesn't work like that. You cannot impress God with whatever you have. God is impressed with who's in you if Christ is in you. And that's really what I want to talk about today, mostly is Christ in you. You know, you can just relax and cancel all your plans to get good. Uh, there may be some in here that's not saved, and you're trying to, well, if I go to church enough, and if I do this, and if I read the Bible, and if I listen to my grandma who loves God, and if I go to church where they're worshiping, maybe God will see I'm trying, I'm trying to be good, but you'll never get good enough, ever get good enough. So you can cancel those plans. What he's waiting for is he's waiting for everyone to accept his son who did exactly what he's wanting. Jesus did it. When you accept Christ, then that's the answer. You can't do it yourself. You can't make yourself acceptable to God. I want to share something with you that's, that's been on my mind for many years, and I didn't know quite how to, how to put it into context. I tried it on Missy yesterday on my wife. It's like, listen to me. She, well, I don't know. And she, no new doctrine. I said, I am not trying to come up with any new doctrine. I would not dare do something like this. But there's some things that you have to understand. You've got to understand the Word of God. And there's so much about the Word of God we don't understand. And you don't have to understand everything. You just have to accept what the Word of God says. The Word of God will do the change in you. Now, physically speaking, to give you a physical example, I know this this goes for all of us. I'm just speaking personally. I was created in my mother. Now, inside of my mother, I was created. I was being put together. God talks about that, and I know the women, whenever somebody's going to have a baby, Susan, the pastor's wife, will give a whole rendition of what happens to the baby, how it happens, how the baby's formed, when the heartbeat starts, things like this. Well, I was created in my mother. I know all of us were. I had no choice of being born or not being born. I had no choice. Now, that was in the hands of my mother. She chose life, thank God. Back in those days, there wasn't much of a choice for death. It was just about all life. Deuteronomy 30, 19. This is my... This is my pro-choice verse. I was going to make a bumper sticker out of it. I never did. Pro-choice. I call heaven and earth to record against you this day that I set before you both blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life. God says choose life. That's pro-choice. God is pro-choice. He wants you to choose. Oh, and uh, here's the right answer. Choose life. That both you and your children may live. Now, when a woman chooses life, her child lives. When a woman chooses death, her child dies. Deuteronomy 30, 19. But before my mother carried me, my grandfather carried me. Are you confused? good <laughs> let me let me uh, let me open this up I, I can prove this my maternal grandfather was born I believe it's 1905 if my grandfather died in 1906 or if my mother died at age two or if I died at age two or if my daughter had died at age two I wouldn't have a grandson If my grandfather died at age two, then we all died at the same time because we were all in him. Is that not true? I was in him. Now, I want to get to in him in Christ, but I was in my grandfather, uh, physically speaking. But he lived, so we all lived in him. 
Now I, we, all of us, we had to catch a ride in our family all the way from the Garden of Eden, in my case, until 1952. I got off the bus in 1952. Now you see why your family is so important? You know, some children disrespect their parents. Bad choice. But you ride in your family all the way down that family line until it's your turn. And then you carry on that family line and somebody else is riding in you. I did not know that when I was a child that Jacob was inside of me. Now he was also inside of the paternal side and the two had to come together. Now I'm a child of my mother. I came from her by her choice. I'm also a child of God. I came from him by my choice after believing and acting on his words. Now you notice that when there's a birth that blood is always shed. When you're born physically, blood is shed. Blood was shed for us when we were born spiritually. Had Jesus not shed his blood, we could not be born again. The Bible says in Leviticus 17.11, For the life of the flesh is in the blood. You know, you, you hear people bleeding to death. What's wrong with them? Well, they just had one little hole in their body in the wrong place. They, they're feeling fine. They were doing great. They have no disease. Nothing except they got a hole in the body and all the blood drained out and they bled to death. I remember hearing one time a story about these two brothers. One brother needed a tran uh, blood transfusion, so the other brother was the, the right candidate. And they hooked him up and his little brother's there and he's there and, and he's giving blood to his brother and he's crying. He's not crying because he feels sorry for his brother. He cr he's crying because he thinks he's dying, because he's given his lifeblood to his brother. He didn't die. <laughs> now, now that I am here physically, I was born, it turns out that although I'm alive in the world, it turned out that I was dead in trespasses and sins. I didn't know that until 1968, listening to this old Baptist preacher tell me how bad I was. I, I never heard that I was bad. But he's talking about sin, he's talking about things like this. And Me? I thought I was pretty good. Ask my mom and dad, I'm a pretty good boy. But he kept ta talking about this sin and being a sinner. Well, I never knew that. So I, had, I got born physically, I got past that hurdle. And now, now I find out that I'm dead, even though I thought I was alive, that I'm dead in trespasses and sins, as far as God is concerned. As far as I was concerned, I was just fine. Now to remedy that, I must be born again. Being born once is not enough. You've got to be born twice. In John 3, 3, Nicodemus, or Jesus told Nicodemus, that except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And of course, Nicodemus thinking, you know, f how can I enter in again to my mother's womb and be born again? Well, you can't. So Jesus was talking about something totally different. You were born physically, but now you have to be born again. So the problem is we must get in Christ. Now, I was in my grandfather and I'm out now. But now I found out I've got to get in Christ. So how do you get in Christ? You get saved. What you do is you believe God when he says that you must be saved. You ask him to save you. The Romans wrote, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death. I don't want death. I want, I want eternal life. I remember this same Baptist preacher, Brother Byron Orand, Big Spring, Texas. He was preaching the gospel. I had never heard the gospel. And I was sitting in my pew like I had epilepsy or something. I'm just going back. Yeah, man, tell me more. I want to hear it. Yeah, tell me more. I was very enlivened. I was hearing life for the first time. He told me I was no good. He told me I was a sinner. But then he turned around and said, here's life. Here's life. 
one time I was teaching the boys over in the Baptist church in Hanahan, and I thought I was really intelligent. I thought, I'm, I'm going to get them really good here. And w- there's a song we sang, I think Rachel sang it last week, uh, What Can Wash Away My Sin? Nothing, nothing but the blood of Jesus. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull one this time. All right, guys, what can wash away your sin? Nothing. And I thought, I'm going to be clever. Next, I'm going to let that bother them. But next week, I'm going to tell them, oh, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Uh, some of them never came back. <laughs> Would you? <laughs> uh, some of them probably said, well, hey, ain't no sense coming back here. And I, I thought I was clever, but I wasn't. I was a bit foolish. I learned from that. <laughs> Nothing but the blood. So, so we must get in Christ. You get saved. After believing, we are put, we are put into Christ by God. Colossians 1.13, one of my favorite verses. When you come to God and realize who you are and realize who he is and say, God, I'd like to make some arrangements with you. I like what you're saying. I'm going to go with it. Well, God delivers us from the power of darkness, that that power that we're walking in all of our life may not even realize it or be aware of it. What God does is he translates us. You know, if if you're talking to somebody in a foreign language, I, I don't know what they're talking about. Somebody has to translate. Somebody has to make my ears so that my ears work listening to this guy. You're going to have to translate. He converts us. He changes us. And he puts us into the kingdom of his dear son. You've got to get into that kingdom. If you don't get into that kingdom, you're going to be left outside. You don't want that. Ephesians 2.10. I said that I was created in my mother. That was very true. You know, you're growing. A baby is growing inside of its mother. A baby cannot come out right away because that baby won't survive. That baby's got to stay in there and that baby's got to develop. In Ephesians 2.10, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. Now I'm in Christ Jesus and God is doing his thing. He's creating me. He's changing me. He's going to do something in me so that he can do something through me. We are grafted in. We are grafted into that 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 olive tree we are the wild olive branch and God takes us and grafts us into that olive branch which is Israel he grafts us in 2nd Corinthians 1 30 but of him are you in Christ Jesus I was sitting out by the river many years ago and I was sitting on a stump I was meditating enjoying the outside and the birds and the trees and the flowers and I'm sitting there thinking How do I get from here to heaven? I can't just stand up and go and get to heaven. Somebody's got to help me. And that's where he comes in. I can't do it on my own. He does it for me. But of him are you in Christ. Now see, at one time, God put me in Christ. I can't get in there on my own. He put me in there. How does he do that? I don't know how he did that. I don't have to understand everything, but I know that he did that. In electronics, we have a term called black box. Uh, I've worked with black boxes many times. Sometimes you can take an electronic chassis, it's not working, and you pull it out and plug another one in, and it works. Well, what's in the black box? Well, you don't have to know. It just works. So you plug it in. This is like a black box. I don't know how God put me in Christ, but he put me in Christ, and that puts me in a good position. I couldn't get there on my own, except that I had to believe him to get me there. 2 Corinthians 5.17, a very well-known verse. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Again, how did I get in Christ? I heard that I could get it. I went to the one that could do it. He did it, I'm in. Colossians 1.27 Not only am I in Christ, 
but Christ is in me. And that's my hope of glory. 1 John 4, 4, I use this many, many times. When, when you feel that oppression come on you and that darkness come on you, I just say, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Who's in the world? Satan and his forces, Satan and his demons. You go out into the, into the world to work Monday morning, and you're going to face those people who don't know God, and there's a spirit out there. And the, the spirit that's in you is greater than that spirit. You go out there and, and you want to you wanna succumb to their spirit and let their spirit take over you? Don't do that. You take over that spirit. You be who God says you are. The greater one is in you. 2 Corinthians 6.16. It says you are the temple of the living God. What is a temple? A temple is where something dwells. I remember over in Japan, I was, I, was a, I, was a, I was alone. I had no family, and I had these friends. I guess they were friends. But they took me to a temple. They took me to a Buddhist temple. And here I was a Christian. I, ah, all right, let's go. So I go in there, and it's like there was a darkness. There was a spirit. There was something that I didn't need. And as a result of going to the temple, I did a little suffering after that. Some spiritual darkness came upon me. I wasn't very strong back then. But I am the temple of God. My body is the temple of God. Now, God lives in me. He's in me. So it, it's not me. I don't have to depend on myself. This morning, I depended on Willie, and I depended on Charles, and I depended on the song leader. I can't do it all myself. I depend on you, the body of Christ. I got people out here that love me. That encourages me. I got people out here that smile. That encourages me. I need you. We need you. We need each other. We need the body of Christ. You are the temple of God. And God says, I will dwell in them and walk in them. So what? God is dwelling in me. He's dwelling in me. And when I walk, he walks. When I go to work in the morning, he's going to walk into work with me, uh, I don't have to believe that, you know. But it would behoove me to believe that and to think about that and meditate on that and realize, okay, maybe I'm nothing, but he's in me, so I'm something. Not in my own head, I'm who he is. Now, this, this next thing here, I, I want to explain to you, I, I'm trying to explain to my wife what I'm trying to say, and she said, don't make new doctrine, and I will not dare make new doctrine. But let me see if I can explain to you the way I understand about Christ being in us. Now, by faith, I accepted Christ into me. I did that by faith. You know, in the old days, back in the 60s, I don't hear it so much now, but have you received Christ? Have you received Christ into your heart? You know, that, that's like a byword. That's, that's like a code word among Christians. I don't know if you ever noticed this, but if you get on the internet and try to put a phrase in there to learn something about faith and learn something about a Bible study or whatever, you, you won't get a positive response because they don't speak our language. Uh, I, try, I did that this week, and I, I can't remember the example, but you can't use our language, the language we speak in church, on the internet because it's like, huh? What? I looked up the word Christ, or I looked up the word Jesus Christ on the internet one time. And what you would think is you got 456 million hits. I think there's about two or three. What? Jesus Christ? It's like they, we don't have nothing to say about it. It's like it's a different world. We're in the world. We're not of the world. Try that. Try looking up Jesus Christ on the internet. Google that and see what you get. After I accepted Christ, then what he had done was credited to my account. I don't know about that. I don't, I, don't, I don't know if I can really accept that. Well, he wants us to accept that. He wants us to think like that, but we don't think like that. We think about the problems that we've got. We think about the finances, the sickness, the weakness, the marriage problems, the problems at work, the problems in the world the problems in uh, politics. But what Jesus did was credited 
to my account as if I had done it. God in Christ did the work. God was in Christ. Christ was in God. Christ is in me. I'm in him. Christ is in you. I'm in Christ. You're in me because he's in you. That's why we have a, a family relationship here. The same one that's in you is in me. Now, I accepted the work that he did, therefore it is to my credit or account. Because of sin, I had to die. I did die. I died in Christ. And I'm still trying to put us in Christ and, and with your understanding. You know how I, was in, how I was in my grandfather. Now I need to get in Christ. When he died, it was to my account because I believed what he said. So I died. So I was buried. So I was raised. So I am seated in heavenly places and I have authority. And I accomplished all of this in Christ. When Paul attended the stoning of Stephen, he could not say that he was crucified with Christ at that time because he had not yet accepted him. Christ was crucified, but Saul was not. When Saul believed, then he could say he was crucified with Christ because Christ's account or Christ's life, his acts, his history was now Paul's because that same Christ was now in Paul. Now how intimate can you get? That's more intimate than you can be with your spouse. Galatians 2.20 you know, Paul says, I'm crucified with Christ. And you try to think to yourself, here I live now in 2013, how am I crucified with Christ? I wasn't even there back then. You weren't there, but he was. And because he's now in you, you were crucified with Christ. So everything he did goes to your account now. You can't do it on your own. You can't accomplish it on, on your own. I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. I can use the faith of Jesus to live my everyday life now. Romans 6.6, 6, knowing this, knowing this, you've got to know this. You've got to know that your old man is crucified with him. You know the old song, were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you there? And I say, absolutely. Well, you weren't even born yet. Yeah, but I was there. Because see, the one that was there, the one that was crucified, he's now in me. It's all to my credit. If I don't believe this, I'm going to live a mediocre Christian life. If I begin to get a little bit crazy and start believing this, then I'm going to start living a super life, a spiritual life, the life that Jesus lived, the life that God wants us to live. Romans 6, 4. If I was crucified with Christ because that I was in Christ, it's hard to understand. I was in Christ. Well, I wasn't, but now I am because now I believe, so I was in Christ. Is that thoroughly complicated? I, I'm trying to clear it up because you, you accept Christ by faith. You don't get a package in the mail after you get saved from FedEx. Say, okay, here's your membership. Now just put this little badge on and say these little words and you're in. It's by faith. You don't get notification in the mail. The notification you get is in your spirit. Christ is already inside your spirit. That's where you get the notification. He lets us know that we are the children of God. So Romans 6, 4, we're buried with him in baptism. That's why it's so important, you know, getting baptized doesn't save you, but when you get saved, you need to continue on and be obedient in baptism and do what God says and get baptized. So then, if we were, we were in Christ, if we were crucified with him, if we are buried with him, then we're raised with Christ. Ephesians 2, 5, and 6. When we, when we were dead in sins... He quickened us. That means he made us alive together with Christ. Now, we know that Jesus was dead and in the tomb, 
And we know that God quickened him, but he says, quickened us together with Christ. So God says that you were quickened together with Christ. So God says that you were in Christ. God says you were buried with him. God says you were crucified with him. Paul says we were crucified with him. What do you say? And has raised us up together. He, he raised us together. He made us alive together. He raised us together. And with our sins now paid for, we now have a new life to live. I want you to look at Matthew 27, 50. This is very interesting. And I took this apart and I put dashes in it. Jesus cried with a loud voice upon the cross. Then he yielded up the ghost. And the word says, behold, or it says, look, the veil in the temple was rent in two from top to bottom. Rent means ripped or tore. And the significance is it was not writ, ripped from the bottom up. Man is down here. God is up here. God ripped that curtain open. What did he do when he rent it open? He made an opening for us that now we could go into the Holy of Holies without a priest to go in there for us. We can go directly in there from top to bottom. Also, the earth quaked. Has anybody ever been in an earthquake? I've been in two. I've been in a shaker and I've been in a roller. And I don't like that shaking and rolling. I like the, everything nice and calm. But when things start moving and start shaking... Things start breaking apart. Things start falling. The rocks rent. So the rocks cracked. The rocks opened. This was quite an event this day. And it says the graves were opened. Well, if the graves are in the ground and the ground is cracking open, then the graves are going to open. And it says many bodies of the saints which slept arose. What a news story that day. And, and, these, and many of these bodies came out of the graves after his resurrection. They went into Jerusalem and they appeared to many. Now, Jesus, when he died on the cross, he said, it is finished. Some people say he went to hell. Some people say he didn't. The fact is, I know for a fact that he went to paradise. I know for a fact that paradise is in below the earth. And that there's a gulf between paradise and hell, the side you don't want to be on. Because the rich, the rich man was over there that fared sumptuously every day. And he looked over and he saw Lazarus who used to beg at his gate. He saw him in the bosom of Abraham. Well, in the bosom of Abraham, another name for this place, paradise, is where all of the saints are waiting for that day of redemption. Well, that day had come. Jesus was on, was on the cross. He went down into paradise. He did whatever he does. He preached to the captives. He says, look, this is the one, I'm the one you've been waiting for. Now, he was a young feller, and he was preaching to all these old guys that he had come from. He was preaching to grandpa and great-grandpa, people that were waiting for him, looking for him. He was preaching to Abraham, and he was, and I, don't you know David got excited? David was down there. He was preaching to David. David, his great-great-great-great-great-great-great-grandpa. He was preaching to him. And then when they finished preaching, Jesus said, okay, let's go. Well, their spirits are down there, not their bodies. Their bodies are way up on the surface in the graves, which had just opened up. Now, it didn't say they came out when Jesus died. It said they were opened. And then after Jesus arose, then they arose. Well, if he's down there preaching to them, and he's preaching them the good news, and this is what they've been waiting. How long do you think Abel's been waiting? A long time. So finally they hear the good news. They get the preacher of preachers down there to preach to them. And he says, okay, that's it. Let's go. Well, as they're leaving, this is me. you got to picture something. The word says something. They're coming back up to the surface of the earth because heaven is way on up. So you've got to come up through the surface. And David says, hey, wait a minute. There's my body over there. Let me go get my body. So he goes over there and gets in his body. I'm not making this up. I'm just putting it into words. God said this. And David said, you know what? 
Jesus, can I, can I just hang around a little bit here? I'd kind of like to go in and see the old home place, you know, see where I was raised. Of course, he, he probably went up the road. Man, I don't, is, this must be, I recognize the Mount of Olives. This is it. I used to live right over there. We used to play right over here. And don't you know he had a good time walking around town, these people seeing him. And, you know, the people that were alive didn't know what he looked like, but I believe that they knew who he was. That's David. What's going on here? What happened on Calvary the other morning? All this excitement, this earthquake, the graves open. What's he doing here? What's going on here? Something happened. You know, the guy that crucified Jesus said, surely this was the Son of God. Something has happened today. Something big has happened. And I think David had a really good time, a real good time. And then I don't know how long it took. I don't know the, the, the time frame, but I'm ready to go. Go on up. Now, Jesus was caught up in the clouds. I don't know at what time these other saints, because they didn't die again. They couldn't die again. Now they have their resurrected bodies. So it's always been preached that Jesus is the only man in heaven. Well, these people didn't die again, and, and their bodies I can't see that. But this is a little uh, verse that you don't hear much about. It's not preached about or talked about much. But it's kind of exciting to me. You know, I always thought if you would go to Jerusalem, you guys that have been to Jerusalem, Willie and Linda and Mike, they, they probably talk, took you to the tomb of whoever, right? I don't know if the tomb of David was there is it but anyway they, okay this is the tomb of David this is where David's buried and if you know Matthew 27 man, he ain't buried there he can't be buried there but if they excavated I bet they would probably find bones in there because hey the graves were open he ain't there no more let's put this dude in there and seal it up the grave of the unknown soldier in Washington who's in there I don't know somebody's in there there's some bones in there and I don't know if they can do something nowadays with, uh, you know, with the uh, DNA. I don't know how they would trace that far back. Maybe they can do it. Uh, Yosemite National Park, they got, what's that big tree called? General, the General Grant tree. It, was, it had a little sign there that says it's 5,000 years old. And this, this one ranger says, and this is the General Grant tree. It is 5,012 years old. Well, how do you know it's 5,012 years? Well, when I got here, they said it was 5,000 years old. I've been working here 12 years. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, they, they try to carbon date this stuff, and I don't give much credence to it. I, you know, how can they say on the Education Channel, well, this rock here is, is uh, 62 million years old? <laughs> and I could say, no, it's not. It's 61 million years old. <laughs> well, how do you know that? Well, how do you know that? So it's whatever you say. <laughs> but the graves were rent. They were opened. There was a fissure in the earth. And the last thing, seated with Christ. You know, we hear that we're seated with Christ. Um, you know, we have benefits. And David says, forget not all his benefits. But we have benefits that we don't know about. When I got out of the military, I went to the VA, and they said, oh, well, you were in the military. You, you've got some benefits here. So what they did is they set me up in a training program to be a radio repair apprentice, and the military gave me a paycheck while my boss was giving me a paycheck. You can't beat that. Now, back in those days, it was just about nothing, back in 77. But it was something. It, it, it made a living for me. But benefits, there's benefits, there's benefits, and we don't use our benefits. If we don't know that we're seated with Christ, that's a benefit that we're not taking advantage of. You know, if he's in me, I can go into any room, into any meeting, any crowd, any situation, knowing that he's in me, and like uh, I think it was uh, Bill said today that God speaks. You know, you've got to listen to God when he speaks. You know, I heard somebody say that God is speaking all the time to us. Well, I don't hear him. Well, he's speaking all the time. Are you listening? Because if you're not listening, you're not going to hear. You've got to listen to what he says. 
Well, maybe that's just me. Well, maybe it is, but listen. Listen to what he says. You, you can't figure out everything by yourself. You can't, you can't know the whole Bible yourself, but the one that's in you, he is the word. He knows the word. He can give you that, that exact word you need at that exact time if you listen to him. You've got to listen to him. So we are seated in heavenly places. How can I be seated if I'm standing right here? Because, see, this is not my home. I'm just passing through. I don't live here. I operate here. I'm an ambassador sent from that kingdom to here to be an ambassador of Christ. All of us are sent here to be ambassadors to Christ. Some of you out there nodding your head. <laughs> Some of you are gone. So I got good news for you. We're almost ready. There's that little kid that encouraged me so much right there. So to wrap up, let me ask you, whose side have you chosen? Are, are you waiting for a side to be chosen for you? It's not going to happen. You're going to have to stand out, stand out, step out on your own by what you've heard of the Word of God, and you're going to have to make a decision. It is all to our account what he did. If you don't believe that, you're going to have trouble. If you do believe that and act on it, your life is going to change. It's all to his account what we did. All of my sin went to his account. And if you feel dirty, like Charles was saying, washing your hands, you, you know, some of you right now, I know you feel, you feel a little contaminated, a little bit dirty, something you, you shouldn't be doing or shouldn't have done or shouldn't have said. This is that sin consciousness that's on man. And Satan will, will push that thing. He'll rub it in. He'll make you meditate on that. Well, I'll never make anything of myself. I'll never be able to do anything. I'm here just to make mom happy this morning. But God doesn't see you that way. When God looks at me, see, when I look at myself in the mirror, I see me. When God looks at me, he sees his son. Because, see, his son is in me. His son is in me. Now, I can, I can go as far as I want to go with that. I can be as successful as I want to be with that by just going for that, spending time in it. I shared this before. I'm going to share it one more time. Boy, Pastor Bob said that. I've said this before. He's got all his stories, and his stories have principles. When I go to California to visit my family, I'm no longer in South Carolina. Now I'm in California. Everything's different. The trees are different. The people are different. The atmosphere is different. The houses are different. The procedure of each day is different. The restaurants are different. Everything's different. And it's different because Yosemite is out there and it's not here. You go up there and it's beautiful. And what you do is you get into their schedule. You get into their lifestyle. And everything is California. You're not thinking about your home. That's why a vacation is so important. You're vacating your normal stuff. And you're coming over here and you're getting, you're getting something new and something refreshing. And it's refreshing you. And it's resting you. But when I get on the plane to come back to South Carolina, all I got in my head is California. It's all on me. And what you do is when you spend time in the Word of God, if you don't spend time in the Word of God, then your life, the way your life is, is all that's on you. It's all that you're sensing. But when you spend time in the Word of God, things start changing. But you've got to spend time in it. I was in the Word of God this weekend, all day yesterday, and, wow, look at that. Whoa, I knew it said that. Oh, yeah, but, oh, yeah, that's true. Yeah, I like, hey, I need to hear this more often. It's the old stuff. I said the first verse. Remember that Christ was crucified. Spend time in the Word. And let the word get into you and let it change you gradually. But don't quit tomorrow. Tomorrow, go back into it again. And next week, go back into it again. And stay with it and let it begin to change you. <coughs> Happy resurrection morning. Jesus rose. We rose. Now, let's live a life and enjoy it. If anybody would like to be prayed for, please come on up front and we'll pray for you up here. And I don't think there's anything else to say. You've heard the word. 
So you're dismissed, except for prayer, if anybody needs it. Thank you. <laughs>